Hello. Um, can you all hear me? Maybe not. Um, better now? Um, I'd like to start with uh, thanking Dr. Sheba for giving me a chance to speak about our work. Um, in case you're wondering what a person in a mechanical engineering is doing in this audience, I hope to convince you through this talk that there is a lot of mechanics in insect materials. So um, I'm going to give you a little introduction into two of the projects. Um, I'm a little late entrant into the world of insects. They have always fascinated me. And um, as Professor Gadakar said very nicely, that this kind of work is rather cheap. Uh, all it requires is our creativity. So the first project that I will present is a little continuation of what Professor Ganeshia talked about. Um, what you'll see is the work didn't require so much money. Uh, all it required was interested and clever people, uh, which is my student Lakshmi Nath. So um, I got interested in insects with this, um, with, uh, with looking at um, this uh, wasp, which bores through or cuts through wood. Okay, and when I saw this micrograph of its ovipositor, so the ovipositor is this needle-like thing which is entered inside, and it is used to push eggs inside the substrate. So if you look at this, you clearly think there's something about the mechanics in this project. Um, and what also interested me is people had talked about the presence of zinc and manganese in these kind of regions. So we, we were really fascinated with this idea. And we wanted to go and get some of these insects. Except that I was told that you'll have to go at the foothills of the Himalayas and collect insects. And we are not really trained to do this kind of thing. So we decided to look just outside our window. Outside my lab was this very nice pink racemosa tree, which uh, Professor Ganesh had talked about. And um, as it appeared, that would be on my route every day to coffee. And what we saw there was um, the oviposition, not by the pollinator that Professor Ganesh Shea talked about, but by, um, I think I missed it. I'll start again. So it, this insect is a uh, parasitoid. What you see is, again, this is a female, um, rightly said. She's working very, very hard. She's now trying to figure out what's a good substrate to uh, lay her eggs. And what you see is she's identified with certain chemicals or other stimuli. She starts pushing the ovipositor inside. And now you can think about the kind of challenges that she needs to face. Because she is pushing in on the substrate, which is extremely hard. This uh, needle-like tool that she's using, so the, the sheath comes off. And the one which is left behind is this very thin needle-like tool. It's about 15 micron. Uh, our hair is close to 70, 80 micron. Now she keeps pushing it inside. Uh, and you can see that I, I, one assumes she's laying eggs inside. But after all this energy that she's spent in trying to do this process, you want to try and see how many more eggs you can get inside this uh, fig, because that's more efficient. So you can see she withdraws her abdomen. Hopefully, she's trying to insert some more eggs in this process. The last thing you want to do is to have a part of your body, and that's the business end of, of the most important part, stuck there because what you see is uh, an ant. And this is a small red ant, just for uh, scale. And once the ant comes um, and predates on this, the whole process is over. Now, that was the most fascinating thing we saw, uh, which got us interested. So the things we, we looked at were, what are the challenges that this parasitoid should face? as she tries to oviposit. So one idea is that you have to bore through the substrate several times. And from a mechanics perspective, you want a tool which will not undergo any fracture. It cannot wear out. Because unlike us who make just few babies, these people are inserting or making a lot more uh, of their own brood. So um, it cannot undergo wear, because this process should hopefully happen several times during her lifetime. Um, again, it has to be fatigue resistant. So you have to be able to do this job many, many times. The other thing is this tool has to be very flexible. So if you want something very hard, uh, it already kills the idea of having something which is very steerable. So you want a tool which is hard to pierce, but it needs to be flexible uh, and steerable so it can sort of navigate inside. She has no eyes inside. So she needs to do all this process by figuring out what is the good location that she needs to oviposit? Then again, you must have quick, quick retraction. Because like um, Professor Ganesha mentioned, there could be this latex-like substance, something which is sticky coming out. 
and you don't want your tool to get stuck inside because you want to withdraw quickly and escape. So the questions we asked were, what are these morphological advantages or adaptations that the parasitoid has as compared to the pollinators who seem to enter the syconium through the osteole? So we call it the tail of two wasps. And here is the pollinator, the one which um, you heard about earlier. The one I'm talking about is the second one who is the villain in our story. Uh, what, because what this one needs to do is, so the pollinator has entered through the osteole. And then this is a, a cross section where you see one dead uh, wasp. Um, then the other one comes in. This is the parasitoid which comes in at a later stage. And these are the galls which are developing inside the syconium. And she needs to insert her eggs inside. Um, so when you look at the uh, two different ovipositors, you already start seeing differences. Um, when you look at the parasitoid who needs to cut from outside, um, uh, first of all, it was extremely long. I, I forgot to mention. Okay, so this is very, very long as compared to what the pollinator has. Um, what you see at this business end is teeth-like structures. So it almost looks like a drill bit that you would have seen uh, as a mechanical tool. Uh, this one has a more spoon-shaped uh, morphology. There are many, many sensilli which are present. Uh, so clearly, she is using some of the uh, chemical signals, or she's using all this information. There are also mechanical sensors which are present at that tip. I told you the tip is um, the, the tool itself is about 15 microns, 10 to 15 micron. And the part which enters is about 4 to 5 millimeters. So already you have a tool which is extreme, which has a completely different aspect ratio. It's like taking your hair and trying to push it inside wood. And you need to pierce it inside the wood. So that's the challenge that the wasp has. Uh, what we what we hypothesized was for this tool to work, uh, for her to push it inside, it needs to be, one is, of course, it's sharp. The second is this cutting part should have something very, very, which makes it extremely hard. So we said, let's go and see if it has any transition metals, which was showed in the wood boring insects. Um, so what we did here is we've taken a scanning electron micrograph. On that, we have a detector called an EDAX detector. It, it's called an energy dispersive X-ray analysis. Uh, with this technique, one is able to tell what are the kind of elements which are present uh, in that. It's a, a, quant a semi-quantitative technique to say how much amount could be present. But again, what you see in this picture here, here is how much of the X-ray counts versus the energy. And you can see that um, the, the parasitoid at the tip only has very high amounts of which corresponds to zinc, the K line, and this is the L line. You don't see this happen in any of the pollinator or the regions of this very far away from the tip. Okay? So this is telling us that the tip has somehow gotten enriched with zinc uh, through this experiment. Then we ask the question, is this region uh, where zinc is present, could it be preferentially harder? Now to do that, one needs to work with, um, uh, but we decided to use this technique called atomic force microscopy. It's used very often in biology and material science to image materials, uh, surfaces of materials. You can also use it to probe uh, different properties. So what one does is you have a cantilever, and uh, you watch the interactions of this tip with the sample. And what you get as you approach, uh, the, the tip suddenly comes into contact uh, with the substrate, and then you start piercing it inside. Okay, As the material, as the tip is getting pushed inside, what you measure is how hard or stiff that material can be. And then you can come back down the curve, and you get lift off. So from this set of experiments, you get the force versus depth that the cantilever has pierced inside. And that gives a measure. And by calculating the slope of this curve, it tells us um, how, how stiff that material was. So this is a picture of where we select different locations. So you have to be careful uh, on which locations we are going to indent. Now, when we do these experiments with many number of insects, what we see is, uh, and we've done it at the tip regions uh, versus the non-tip regions. And you see that the tip, tip is significantly has a higher modulus and a significantly higher hardness as compared to the non-tip regions. So this goes on to tell that Regions which have zinc have clearly higher hardness as compared to that which doesn't have the zinc. And it seems to be only located in the teeth-like regions in the uh, parasitoid, and we see nothing in the pollinator. 
So, uh, so then we also went on to estimate how much force the insect could be exerting as she pushes inside based on looking at structures like this because if you have a column and you keep adding load to it, the minute it buckles, it means the structure does not work for us. So, just based on simple ideas of how columns work, we can calculate how much amount of force it takes and we watch at what point in that video uh, that ovipositor buckles. And so, this gives us an idea how much force that insect could be exerting in doing this process. Okay. So, this was our first foray into um, insects and then we got interested in looking at whether zinc is commonly used in all kinds of materials uh, or all by many other species of insects. Um, so, as and like I said, this project was not even funded. Uh, it, 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 was, it was all simple, uh, but then now we get funded to do this kind of work. And the project which came to us was that with a coffee board. So, what we have here is a coffee plantation and you see the density of trees which are in this locality. And someone came to us and said that we have these borers, these beetles which seem to be eating up the wood uh, and it is not good. Okay? Although I was excited to hear that there could be wood borers actually doing some fun stuff. The growers are not happy because I, this is a big source of revenue uh, for them and for the state and currently there are 40 percent or higher losses of Arabica coffee which is the fine coffee we all like to drink. It appears that the beetle also likes to eat this wood. Um, and the beetle has been chewing up the wood and has been destroying the plantations. So, it is a serious problem. We got interested because I wanted to see what is how is the mandible of this insect working. So, you see this is the this is the beetle it is called Xylotrichus quadrupus and this is the, the mandible which you can see is extremely dark colored. Uh, dark coloration uh, of this uh, cuticle also suggests there is some amount of cross linking that has happened in the different proteins which are present because it makes it tougher. Okay. Uh, what you see is a cross section of the coffee wood and inside you will see all these regions which are bored. And to tell you a little more about how this works, uh, what you have is an adult when she goes and lays eggs, the little larvae eat around the live wood and they create these ridges. These were easy for, uh, for growers to track initially, but they are extremely hard for us to spot. Uh, but once, but after the insect eats ab about first or second stage, it enters and as it is eating, it is constantly um, uh, the, the excreta or the fecal material is getting packed inside and um, all this is, this all of it is the uh, part of the wood which is not edible. So, most likely the lignin content, it gets very tightly packed uh, into this canal and um, the growers actually came to us to say, can you tell us which trees are infected? Uh, and so, I will tell you a little bit about that because it is an applications part of where we work. Um, so, the question we asked was that we have seen a lot of interesting things on how zinc is working in these materials. So, can, uh, can we look at these mandibles and understand how is the shape of this uh, structure, what is the property of this, uh, of this material and next question is how is it able to cut through something which is, such, which is really hard and we can just touch the tables and see how hard that wood is. So, how is this insect able to cut through something so, uh, so hard? So, um, so, like I mentioned the interest the thing which the, the way the larva works is it, it lives inside the wood. So, it is nice because there is no predation for this animal pretty much and given the number of trees in that vicinity, um, it is just a compound the whole problem has become very, very big. So, it lives inside for about 8 to 10 months. So, its development is extremely slow. We have very little idea of how much it is eating okay, and what are its preference, whether it is starting from the top coming down, is there a pattern, very little idea. But the question we started out with is, is there a zinc or is there manganese associated with the cutting process? Are these, what are these local properties that you can measure of this material? So, what we did was again we took some scanning electron micrographs and these dark regions are called sclerotization of the cuticle. It is like tanning, it is like when you start with um, skin of an animal and you want to convert it into your. We are interested in doing is segmenting out this entire mandible. What you can see is that there are muscle connections uh, from this mandible to, uh, uh, to the rest of the body and these are essential because it helps the animal move and you can see that you have only certain degrees of freedom which are allowed by this insect. So, it also gives us a handle of how the 
uh, mandible is starting to work. So it sort of just scrapes that way. So going back, mm, Okay, so what we now do now based on this model, we now try and understand what are the smallest chips that this insect is able to get. And this is where we do a lot of our mechanics. Uh, this is a new model that we have come up with to analyze how much the insect has to penetrate inside and how is this shape uh, going to help us come up with a small chip size. So I won't go into details, but the point I want to highlight is that this is where we understand very little about how uh, woodcutters in nature work. Uh, if you look at the shape, this is very similar and optimized to the kind of tool steels that one uses to cut wood uh, in our industries. The, the question is, how is this shape helping? Uh, and we can tell that this shape seems to be optimized to generate chips which are about 100 micron in size. So it tells us that for this size of a mandible, which is at its fourth instar stage, which we have studied, uh, the, the chips uh, uh, are produced, which are ideal for this insect to eat. What we also did is we looked at the role of this hollow region, and we said a lot of it seems to be hollow. So again, we extracted out all of this, and we put it in, in the form of a model to understand what is the load distributions. Because like I told you, that if we, so this is the stress, which um, uh, how much this is the stress, and you can see that at the front of the mandible, which is in region of contact with the wood, you can see that the stresses are extremely high in these regions. So you want to develop a material which has a graded, it's a functional tool. So you have to grade the stiffness as you go from top to bottom, and that seems to be done nicely because the stresses are extremely high at the tip region. So you want to make sure that these these regions are somehow reinforced so that they don't fracture off as the insect is trying to cut through this process. What you also saw in that video was that about 50% of this uh, mandible is completely hollow. Okay, So the hollowness seems to suggest that something about the loading process is important. Second reason is that if you have, uh, if you are an insect, you don't want to log a lot of material to do that job. So you want a structure which is optimized. It works well in the sense that it is sharp, it's able to initiate fractures, and it's able to withstand the loads at the base of that tool. But you don't want to lug around a lot of weight. So it's similar to how bamboos are um, hollow, in uh, hollow inside, but they still work uh, much better than most uh, structures which are completely filled. So it seems like a lot of these mechanical design principles that one would apply to our kind of structure seem to be working very well for uh, these kind of mandibles. So I want to sort of tell you one last part of the kind of damage that is, so what we are looking at is uh, the interesting idea of how um, mandibles work. What we are actually paid to do is to find out which trees have borers. So what we did was we showed that uh, you can use x-rays to image these trees in the field, and what you can see is the black regions are regions where the borer has worked and has removed material. But remember, it has removed material but packed it up with other kinds of wood, which made the problem extremely difficult. But whilst the, the growers are happy, what makes us more happy is we now have a tool to go and study how the borer seems to be working during its development. Uh, because what we can show is that we can pick up, based on the size of the wood, uh, of the bored regions, we can pick up something which is as early as a first instar. So this gives us a handle to see inside the wood of when the insect is doing its job. Of course, I don't understand what the interactions of x-ray or that constant exposure will be to the insect. But clearly, if you take a periodic scan of this thing, it will tell us how the insect is actually working, and it gives us a handle into studying its behavior. So these are some of the main questions which have come up. Uh, and I want to just conclude by saying that um, we have looked at two different species, and we have showed that all, both of them seem to have zinc enrichment. And these regions are um, harder than surrounding regions, which show that perhaps zinc is being used very cleverly in nature. And the shape of the mandible seems to be very critical. And it seems to be well developed for doing its job very, very efficiently. And this whole process makes this 
uh, Beetle a very good, uh, very good at its work, and uh, hence it has made our job a lot more tricky on how do we find it early in its uh, work. So I'd like to thank my students. Um, Lakshmina did all the work on um, the fig wasp and partly some on the wood uh, related uh, the beetle work. And uh, Nimesh and Abhijit, they both, they're all, none of them stay here. <laughs> they now live in the US. Uh, so they're both graduate students. And so is Rajiv, who helped with some of the x-ray work. So, um, and I'd like to thank all my collaborators on the various projects. So thank you very much. Uh, we can take some quick questions. Suppose if a stem borer is left in a bare land, how can it find its food, like wood? Does a pheromone play any role in that? So I don't directly study this, but there are people who try and understand how the uh, xylotricus goes and finds the tree which is of interest. What I didn't talk about is there are actually two different kinds of coffee trees uh, which are present in most of these plantations. One is called Arabica and one is called Robusta. Um, the insect seems to go after the Arabica, which is also the coffee we really like. We don't like the Robusta as much. So clearly there are um, some things that are uh, working for the insect to find this. What rather than, so to find its substrate, it's not as much of pheromone. It could be other um, chemicals that it is seeking out. For us, we have looked at it from a mechanics perspective. Are there differences in the Arabica versus Robusta wood itself? Because our hypothesis was that the Robusta is too hard for it to chew. And um, we are not finished most of these experiments, but what we are showing is that the Robusta is clearly harder and it is more dense as a wood as compared to the Arabica. So perhaps these are would affect the insect from cutting inside uh, and growing inside. There are other groups who are trying to look at whether each of these trees are giving out different um, chemicals which can kill off the early larvae. Uh, but again, this is not known at all. So it might take another few years before anyone has an idea of why the insect prefers certain substrates or whether the tree has come up with its own mechanism uh, to, to combat such uh, infestations. Okay, another more question, please. Generally, cattle don't graze upon these uh, coffee plants as they produce secondary metabolites called caffeine. Why do they infect coffee plants? Why do stem borers? Why do stem borers uh, infect? So there are a lot of borers. Uh, the one which we are looking at is coffee because clearly coffee is an economically important cash crop for us. Uh, but there are others. If you go to forests, you will see there's a lot of uh, small amount of wood which is put all around these trees. All of it is work done by different kinds of borers. Um, so why they go after trees, I, I don't think I'm, um, I, I can answer that question, why they do this. What it offers as um, protection is a nice cozy environment where all the larvae can develop and there's very little predation for these insects. Um, that's the best I can do, but perhaps uh, Professor Gadakkar or someone can answer that. Uh. Caffeine content, like we, uh, you are talking about wood borer, the coffee white stem borer, the Xylotropus quadrifus. That's the same mechanism which works in coffee berry borer also. They have the mechanism to degrade the caffeine, and they have the gut microbiota which does the function for them. And, uh, uh, well, the microbiota is mainly in these is mainly designed to chew up the uh, the cellulose. That is there, but right. there are gut microbiota which are important in degrading the caffeine content also. Okay, but uh, I would not expect there's much caffeine in the stem as compared to that there. of the stem. It it's so been proven and then caffeine content is toxic for insects. That's the question what he's asking. I see. The, yeah, the in, it has an insecticide potency. Yeah, I'm so not an insect uh, person. I look at yeah. the other, and, sub, uh, uh, the uh, insect plant interaction okay, I more. Think, uh, I'm Just sorry, I, I think we can take the questions uh, for, uh, to the coffee session because we'll, uh, we're running a little late. Uh, so I'd, let's continue the coffee. No, let's just continue the questions later. 
It's a good question, but the answer is a little long. So I'm going to answer you over the coffee break. Okay? I'm, so, I'm <laughs> very you. sorry. You can